Good afternoon, commissioners, ex officios. For the record, my name is Krista Hansen, and I'm the chief financial officer of the Gambling Commission. Today, I am here to give you a budget update. Next slide, please. So, um, as a precursor to the budget information I want to give you, I just want to give you an overview of where we were a year ago and um, how, how things are going, what we expected and, and how things are going. So a year ago we met and we uh, were before you and asked you to consider rulemaking to increase our fees because of projected revenue shortfalls. Through a series of tribal consultations and stakeholder meetings, we uh, proposed a couple of different models and um, by the end of all of those discussions, you all approved a um, an increase in our fees that was sufficient for a single fiscal year uh, revenue increase. We expected that that single that the fee increase that we did to support us for the most part for this fiscal year. Uh, and just as a reminder, we increased fees on organizations, 60% increase. Uh, we did. Uh, expect that we may have to still cover some of the gap between revenue and expenditures out of some of our available fund balance. And we did also note that we might have to come back and have discussions about fees for fiscal year 25, depending on how things went. Next slide, please. So as, as after that rule was um approved it was implemented prior or i'm sorry it was effective prior to june 30 and when we were looking at those numbers we assumed that there would be a three percent increase in the gross gambling receipts reported that assumed increase was based on historical numbers so if we looked at the growth rate of gross gambling receipts in prior years in general we saw about a three percent increase so we assumed that would still happen um, that that reporting increase plus the fees being changed, we estimated would, in, would result in a $2 million uh, revenue increase. And as I mentioned previously, that we would use any available fund balance to supplement the revenue and expenditure gap. When that rule went into effect, uh, it had a rolling implementation because the licensees were not subject to the new rates until their licenses were renewed. And so why that's important is because it will take an entire year before we know the full effect of the increased fees because our organizations renew quarterly. So as they renew, then the first quarter they file after their renewal, they're subject to those higher quarterly rates. So next slide, please. So at this point, we're in January, so we only have one quarter of data to look at for these increased um, rates. So this slide is a comparison of what we saw in 2022 quarter three uh, compared to what we saw in 2023 quarter three uh, calendar quarter. So as I mentioned previously, we anticipated seeing a 3% increase in gross gambling receipts reported. We actually saw those numbers fall uh, just over four and a half percent. Our number of licenses that filed gross gambling, I'm sorry, that, that filed quarterly licensing reports stayed relatively stable, but because of the reduction in the report of gross gambling receipts, we only saw a revenue increase of uh, just over $20,000. Uh, and when we rolled these out, this, this first quarter of filing represents about 30% of our licensees that are filing. Uh, next slide, please. So this graph uh, plots our year-to-date revenue and our year-to-date expenditures. I would like to note that the expenditures do not include our costs for IT modernization or the website redesign because we're not using current year revenue for those projects. We're currently using um, money set aside in our in our fund. So. You can, it's challenging to tell, but if you were to add up all of our revenue and you add up all of our expenditures, we're about $150,000 in the black right now. Our expenditures will continue to increase because we are 
um, we have been uh, successful in being able to fill some of our vacancies. So right at the end of November, we had 98 employees and we anticipate um, that continuing to increase to hopefully be fully staffed at 114 employees for the new fiscal year. So the expenditures will continue, continue to increase. Um, next slide, please. So for our expenditures for the current fiscal year, um, the, the previous graph, those numbers, our expenditures are about 89% of what we expected to see. Uh, if, we, if we were at 100% of what we projected our expenditures to be, we'd be about $450,000 in the red right now. Uh, we see some of those expenditure costs because we're not staffed at the level that we expected to be at this point. Although we did have 98 employees at the end of November, we expected to have 107. Um, we've also been very prudent about our discretionary travel, um, you know, me, uh, finding virtual training, some conferences, staff have been able to attend virtually, which has significantly um, reduced the travel expenditures that we have. The other two savings areas that we've seen so far are really a delay of those expenditures. Uh, we anticipated having some significant equipment purchases by now, but because of supply chain issues and some worker strikes, those types of things, we're just now being able to procure some equipment. And then um, we are also working on a records management system. And our initial timeline at the time we created our budget anticipated having acquired that software by now but our project timeline had to shift. So that will that is also a delay in expenditure. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our fund balance review, uh, at the beginning of this fiscal year, which started July 1, we had $19.1 million in our fund. Uh, by looking at our year-to-date revenue and expenditures, and that gets us, um, if you, if you did all that math, which I didn't display up there, the our balance as of the end of November before our reserved funds was about 18.7 million. And so then we have a reserved funds. The first is the requirement from OFM for us to have a working capital reserve. That that's about a quarter's worth of our anticipated expenditures, the 5.25 million. We have, as I referenced prior, we have money set aside for our IT modernization project. That was originally 9.1. You know, we're working through that project, so we're down to about 8.6, 8.7 million set aside for that project. And then our website redesign, we had funding set aside. Um, as of the end of November, we still had $26,000 or so reserved. Um, you are probably familiar that our new website went live in mid-December, but because of delays in invoicing and how that works, we won't be fully invoiced for that project until February. And uh, we anticipate that there will not be leftover funds from that project. Um, we're currently working on uh, procuring a new access control system for this building. We've got that budgeted at 80,000, so we wanna set that money aside to make sure we can pay for that. And then the records management system that I referred to, we have $300,000 set aside to buy that software and get it implemented. So after that, if you do all that math, that gets us to $4.38 million. For reference, when I was before you in July for the budget proposal that you approved, our fund balance was $5 million. So uh, next slide, please. When I was before you in July and you approved the budget, uh, the fiscal year 25 budget was $20.5 million. And it, uh, I just wanted to review what it already includes. It includes being fully staffed for the entire year. And with those uh, fully staffed, it includes the 3% salary increase that we knew about that was approved by the legislature. It also uh, included the central service agency increases. And for anyone that isn't familiar, those are um, the DES and WATEC and Secretary of State, all those services that we have to pay for. We can't procure the services anywhere else. We don't get to negotiate. Uh, we included those increases as well based on what was in the budget passed last year by the legislature. And then for all of those other expenditures that we have that aren't mandated through those two things, 
we uh, built in a general increase of 2% because costs always go up. So all of those things are already included in the 20.5 million. Um, next slide, please. These are our unknowns. So I, when I reviewed the fund balance, you know, I said that we have money set aside to uh, purchase and implement a record management system. That will not be something that we build in-house. We'll be buying it from someone. So we will have to pay annual license fees to keep that system working. We don't know what kind of costs those will be yet. Um, we also don't know what the final supplemental budget will be that's passed by legislature, but we do know that the governor's budget showed an additional $800,000 in expenditures for us. And then for our IT systems replacement, you know, we have about $8.6 million still set aside for that project. Uh, we have a request for information out right now. Vendors are supposed to get back to us, or they will get back to us by Monday the 15th. And part of what we've asked for is an estimated cost to uh, replace th that legacy system that we're working on. So we're not sure of what that actual cost will be yet. If it comes in a, above 8.6, we haven't budgeted for that. And then the annual license fees for that system also are not yet budgeted for because we don't uh, know what those might look like. Uh, related to our IT systems replacement, Currently, we have in-house systems that help us with our asset management and our fleet management. We're currently researching costs for those uh, replacement systems and the ongoing licensing fees for those as well, but we don't, we don't yet know what those costs may be. That is the end of my presentation. So uh, my last slide. Questions? Yeah, I have a couple questions, sure. things that I might have been told before, but does the um, central service agencies and that include our legal fees? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then for the working capital reserve, the OFM requirement, how is that number determined? Is it a percentage or a? So OFM doesn't dictate how much of a working capital reserve we have to have. Um, ours is for three months. Since our revenue is cyclic on the quarter, that's a three month reserve for us. I would also note, just for clarification, the difference between central services and our attorney general bill. Central services, those are set in the budget, were billed by FTE. It doesn't change. Um, the AGO bill were billed based on how many hours you know we use. So that that bill does fluctuate. The central services do not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? So the yeah, two percent for like two percent of what number? Oh, so the, I'm so over what was budgeted for fiscal year 24. So, for example, utility costs. When we proposed our budget for fiscal year 24, we looked at what it had been and what the rate of increase was, and then just kept that moving along for the next year. So. Those are in the, um, it's all, yes, yeah, so it's already budgeted because that was defined by the the budget that was passed by legislature. So yes, those have already been accounted for. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next is tab 10. Um, the fee increase with Lisa McLean. Lisa McLean, um, tab 10 is regarding the subject that, uh, or follow on to what uh, Christina was just discussing. Uh, given the budget, and the fact that five months of revenue and expenditure data uh, with our new fee changes with the new fees uh, show that we're not collecting enough revenue. Uh, we think that we're not going to have enough money. We may not have enough money to sufficient uh, funds to cover licensing regulation and enforcement needs. And so therefore staff is recommending to initiate rulemaking to address license fees, fee increases to cover the costs of licensing regulation and enforcement. And I think with permission, I just say we're, we need to open this topic. Um, 
in order to base to get new, new fees in place by June. But at the same time, as we collect more revenue, um, if, if the budget situation were to change, I'm sure that Christina will be here with us uh, in the coming months. Um, yes, if, if we feel that we, we find that we don't need to uh, increase the fees, we can always uh, retract the initiate the rule initiation initiation of the rulemaking. So if, does anybody have any questions of myself or my colleagues, Priscilla, who has remained behind? Yeah, so to go through a, a, a fee increase rulemaking process, four months, something like that, four or five months. Um, I mean, uh, having them effective by that July quarter is just, like gives us the biggest bang for the buck, right? I mean, really we could do this at any quarter and affect new licensees that will be renewing at that September quarter, January, October quarter, January quarter. Sure, so Chrisinda here again. Um, yeah, so 30% uh, of our organizational licenses that file quarterly licensing reports renew effective, their licenses are effective July 1 of each year. So a rule that goes into effect prior to July 1, the increase would uh, be effective on the greatest number of licensees that renew in that in that quarter. But yet, essentially, yes, if we miss the July 1 deadline, then it would, it would be effective the next quarter and just you know, follow the cycle until, you know, it would be, fully effective than, you know, September of the following year. Yes. Any other questions? So staff also be doing an analysis of how the fee increases uh, might potentially, potential, possibly affect the legitimacy of these businesses that we depend on for this money. Well, I mean, if there's going to be an increase in their fees, um, how does that affect them? I mean, how does that affect their their ability to to um, continue? Um, I know that they've been a lot of them have been shutting their doors. I mean, I think there's a consistent history of them shutting their doors, fewer and fewer of them. If we depend upon them for our existence, and in order for us to continue to function well, uh, we have to generate revenue from them. If we raise the fees, are we potential, potentially jeopardizing the goose that's laying our golden egg? And what can we do about that if that's the case? I mean, I don't know if it is the case, but it feels like there's a cyclical problem here to me. So I think that it would be interesting to do some brainstorming about what kinds of rules and regulations we should be considering that might reduce impact on these businesses that we depend on so that they can afford these fee increases so that we can continue to exist to regulate them. See, so I think that it's, it's not just raising fees, it's a whole bunch of di different things that go together here. Just throwing that out. Saw some of this in the discussion that we had about raising the wager limits several months ago, and there was a graph that was put together that showed the number of at least house bank card rooms over time. Mm -hmm. and it showed that it peaked at one point, I think, in 2009, mm -hmm. and it's been steadily decline, declining ever since. So I don't see that there's a direct correlation between our fees and the number of at least house bank card rooms because for our fees and it didn't make a difference in the number of house bank card rooms in that graph that we saw. Mm -hmm. So I, I I understand your concerns, but 
I don't know if the if I see the the facts that support it. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm asked. I don't I don't see it either. And that's what I'm wondering is if we will ask for that. I just think that we should be cognizant of the effect. I know that we want to solve our own problem here. We have to be able to continue to operate legitimately, but I think that we should be aware of the full potential impact that this action might have. So it's a it's a rhetorical question at this point. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I am not interested in an across the board uh, fee increase uh, rule at this point. Um, and actually, I don't ever want to be for an across the board fee increase. Um, and so, I mean, I think if we look at the factors, um, I'm, you know, a little bit of it, you know, it's, it's science and gut. I mean, I'm the whole process of trying to figure this stuff out. Um, and uh, you know, you, we want to hit it right. So I think, I mean, there is you know, some tipping point where if the fee goes up enough, somebody is going to make a decision not to continue uh, doing that activity. So, you know, the one thing, you know, when we created this system, we established base rates, percentages, and then a max fee uh, that you, was the maximum that that activity could pay in a license year. So um, I think we saw, you know, a little bit with the increase that we did last year, uh, everything was uniform except for the electronic raffles and staff had good data that uh, had those increased quite a bit more than what the across the board uh, and every other activity were. So, you know, I am, um, I think I'm, I'm pretty positive that we're not going to probably see a repeat of this quarter in, you know, whatever six weeks or so from now, when we see the next quarter's numbers, I don't know if there's, you know, um, taking a half an afternoon to survey various, um, um, licensees out there and ask them, Hey, is your second quarter going to be way better than your first quarter or, you know, or this last quarter versus the, the prior quarter? I don't know if we can do a little bit of survey stuff that would boost our confidence or, you know, lower our confidence, I guess, in what that next quarter is going to do. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I, I think we've got to start sometime and I don't know any better time, but we need to um, look at activities individually. We need to pick a couple of activities and evaluate them over the next six months. Um, and if an, an adjustment's appropriate for within that activity, then we that's the rule that we adopt. So um, I'm, I feel confident that if we um, heard, you know, a proposal from staff for, hey, okay, let, we're going to look at these two activities or three activities or two activities and in individual licenses, and um, and then we can we can just do the work on those, and then you know next year we can do a couple more. So um, and. If in, I guess it would be the March commission meeting, we have a repeat of this quarter where this, you know, the quarter of data that we have, then yeah, okay, maybe we might have to do something, but then we'll still have time to make that effective in September. Um, and that's for, you know, having that, having people um, fall into it when they, they, have their the beginning of their license year. Um, another thought that I have, and this was an assumption I made um, when we did this uh, last year, was that 
everybody's rates would go up when this was effective. So even if you weren't um, renewing your license, that when you paid your quarterlies, you'd be paying on the new rate. So that's something I'd like staff to be able to look into and see if, you know, if, is it prohibitive to, to um, increase the rate mid license year? And if so, should we do legislation so that we can change that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm just, I mean, I, I had to swallow it last year and do it across the board and I didn't, I didn't like it. I don't want to do it again. So, I, I mean, if we start it and we ha have, um, you know, the rulemaking begins, I'm certainly going to work in good faith to, you know, not do it as an across the board and um and try to figure out maybe just a couple things that need to be tweaked but yeah i i mean i'll i'll work with everyone if we if we end up um initiating this rulemaking but i can't support it so it, and so there's a lot of work that has to be done but then it begs the question if we did those tweaks that you're alluding to would that be enough to generate yeah. the revenue so there's a, there's work to be done. Commissioner, can I add something I forgot to add is that uh, last night and during the meeting today, we've received two comments. They're related to electronic raffles. They're coming from the electronic raffles in uh, sort of objecting to uh, the idea. I printed out, we've printed that out and it's in it's at your desk. We have one from the sports teams and another from David Trout um, of Bump. Um, that's yes, guys. So, oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt the flow of mm -hmm. debate here. Just wanted to make sure I got that in. Thank you. And, um, Vicki, yeah. Well, you, you, you did oh, tell me the other day that you got oh, So, I was ready for it already. Right. The crack in the <laughs> city box. In the future, I will sign up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The okay, the there we go. Thank you. I'm Vicki Christopherson on behalf of Maverick Gaming, and um, I just want to weigh in here and, and uh, first thank Commissioner Patterson and Commissioner Sizemore for your comments. I think you're getting at exactly, I think, where we are. We have never opposed a, a fee increase and, and don't really want to, <laughs> but uh, we do look forward to um, really thoughtful conversations and hopefully collaboration with the industries that you regulate to figure out how to create a more sustainable future here. It is, there are economic pressures. We're all feeling them. You're feeling them and we're feeling them. And the other licensees that you've heard from are feeling them. And I think we all come to this wanting the commission to be healthy and wanting our businesses to be healthy. So we, we would really like to work with you. And so hopefully this initiation of rulemaking, if it occurs, um, can include licensees in a conversation on how we can better ensure stable funding for you and keep our businesses stable as well. And we look forward to that work. Yes, you have um, Fred Riviera signed up and he's available for public comment as well. Who? Fred Rivera from the Mariners. Sorry. We're on tab 10. I see. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Fred. Yeah. Are you able to hear him? Yes. Thank you. Um, Fred Rivera, Executive Vice President of the Mariner. Thank you for uh, taking this testimony and for considering this, this issue. Uh, we started, the Seattle Mariners started our 50-50 raffle last season, the 23 season, and some of the other teams have started it before. Uh, it's been a successful uh, effort to raise funds that go directly into our community. Um, for the Mariners, to focus on improving access to baseball, softball, and underserved communities building fields, providing uh, programming, and been able to impact the lives of thousands of kids through the funding that we've raised. Uh, the, the, fund, the licensing uh, costs of operation, as they currently are without any increase, are not insignificant, and they do have an impact on our operations. Combined with what are uh, really our team rules and, and laws for operating the 50-50 raffles, uh, that combination makes it very difficult to get uh, funding back into our community. And so I would ask that the commission consider 
not only speech, but also um, the, uh, the, the rules uh, and laws that we have to operate under. We made some effort to have some rule changes during the last meeting to consider uh, uh, the request to just consider those rules was denied by the majority of the commission. Um, and so we'll be operating next season under the, the old rules uh, written several decades ago. We'll figure out another way to try to get uh, modernization of the effort. But, uh, but in summary, I'd ask the ruling for the fee increase be considered in context of some of the other uh, challenges that we have to operate this funding in short. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Tina uh, or Suzanne. Um, if we initiate rulemaking now, we and we end up with better data next month or three months from now, um, we can pull back our rulemaking. Is that correct? That's correct. You can withdraw mm -hmm. from rulemaking at any point up practically till an en enactment of the rule. Okay. So it would be a and, how, and how long is the rulemaking process? Uh, it, <laughs> so while there's certain statutory uh, guidelines, a lot of this is driven by the code reviser deadlines for filing. Practically, it generally takes about five to six months, um, but it, there's really only a few set timelines in statute. Uh, so it's it's really more you need to let 30 days pass from the CR 101 to the CR 102, and then it's 20 days from the CR 102 to the rule hearing um, are the only firm guideline, and then 30 days from the CR 103 to the enactment of the rule. Sorry. Yes, you have to add in between the 101 and the 102, while there only has to be 30 days until you can have the hearing, there are two weeks that are imposed by the code revisor for publication. Correct. Okay. So, and it, so this is the practical with the statutory requirements. Right. So, um, if you were to initiate rulemaking today, the earliest you could have a hearing with for a 102 would be March, and then the earliest you could have the 103 hearing would be, or take final action, would be in May. Okay. And then at the earliest, it would be 31 days after filing with the code revisor for an effective date, which would be, depending on when we filed that 103, because we do have to compile for the concise explanatory statement, et cetera. It would probably be mid to late June. Okay. Okay. Question. But, but there is an emergency rulemaking also, right? Mm -hmm. We've never qualified for that, basically <laughs> for almost any purpose. Okay. There are narrow grounds for emergency rulemaking okay. that are generally based upon health, safety, and welfare. I've seen under the APA. Okay. Okay, you have a question. So if we do, if we don't initiate rule making, what other vehicle do we have? What 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 can we do instead of initiating this rule making to begin to have very serious conversations about how to address this financial situation? What else could we do? Just we can we can talk about. The Stuff, but I mean, we can talk about ways to reduce regulation. We can, that, but that ultimately would initiate, you know, be some sort of rulemaking um, because a majority of our budget is staff. And so if if we don't have the funds for staffing, right. if, if we're talking big dollars here, which we are, you know, I think only 10 to 15% of our budget is discretionary in I terms of you know, should we do travel or should we get some office expenses? So um, I think at that point, you know, our, our role is a regulatory agency. And so I, that would have to reduce our regulatory efforts. Yeah, that, but my question was, what else could we do besides rulemaking? So it sounds like you don't have, you, just a general conversation was your answer, right? So here, here's the thing. Um, 
I wish that we could signal that we weren't just going to be looking at increasing fees, but that we were going to in initiate a process whereby we were going to look at raising fees, but also we were going to look at other things that we might do through the regulatory process to uh, address the situation. You know, I don't know what it would be. Ways to alleviate the burdens, the financial burdens that um, that we may be placing through our on them through our regulations or rules. Um, you know, other ideas other than just raising fees. I'd like to see us have a broad discussion about all that together in tandem at the same time. And so if we go ahead and move forward and I make and I'm glad to make the motion so that we can continue to talk. But I think that one thing that would be really reassuring is if you said that that conversation would happen through this process. Certainly the commissioners can have a work session so that you can hear that conversation as well. I mean, you can have, we've had work sessions before. I think I wasn't part of them during the fee restructure, um, but we have the benefit of Commissioner Sizemore who was very involved in those work sessions. Um, it's my recollection. Um, we can certainly have conversations about seeking some sort of sustainable funding through the legislature, um, re but reducing, and if you are open, but I, I don't want to have I don't want to have open conversations with licensees about um, ways to reduce our regulatory requirements if that's ultimately not where commissioners are wanting to go. Maybe not. If we reduce our regulatory requirements, then that reduces staff, the number of staff, which then reduces our budgetary requirements. So I'm trying to piece how can we reduce the economic burden on our licensees to solving our economic problem as an agency. So I'm, I'm, I'll need a little bit of help how, we, how to, to link that conversation. Yeah, I guess maybe I would consider if we move forward or whatever, but then asking staff to come back to us and we could do a work session or something, but with their ideas of, you know, different things that can change or, you know, different ideas of how we can go about stuff. And if we could all kind of discuss, you know, have Christina and you know, Tina and whomever else needs to be involved kind of come back with, here's kind of some ideas, suggestions, things we could do, things we could do, but we really don't want to do that. You know what I mean? And then we'd kind of have a starting point to then be able to, to talk. More thoroughly about it. I like that idea. But are, you, are you thinking of doing that as like through the rulemaking process? Like we initiate rulemaking, and then as part of our rulemaking process, we're going to not only hear from licensees as to what the their projected impacts are, but also hear from commission staff as to other avenues to reduce our expenditures um, or to balance our budget besides just increasing fees. I think we could do it that way, um, but I don't know. Is that up to other people if they want to do the rulemaking or, and you know, get it so that way there's, that always provides a little extra pressure to get conversations going, I think, but that's not always good either. So I don't know. Well, <laughs> May, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, since, you know, we did the fee restructure, I mean, last year, because we just did some abort across the board, um, increases um, i i don't know the correlation now between um and i'll just pull one that was really askew uh when we you know initially did the fee restructure was manufacturers so manufacturers were making millions and millions and millions of dollars in the state and paying pennies you know or less than a penny mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they were paying very small, very low um, licensing fees. Um, and uh, again, maybe that's not a lot of work for the agency, regulatory uh, work for the agency, but because we're dual role, regulation plus criminal enforcement, everybody's got to pay some portions of that criminal enforcement piece as well. So I'm, you know, I'm really curious, like what are, and this is kind of 
um, my suggestion earlier is I'm really curious of, uh, you know, who is uh, like gross gambling receipts versus what they're paying in regulatory costs by activity. Um, and then also, um, are there outliers within activities that we are not capturing because our max license fee just isn't high enough? Mm -hmm. So um, those those of us that were around, we had the Seattle hockey or whatever within the nonprofits that was like this outlier of way high uh, gross gambling receipts compared to every other nonprofit similarly situated. Um, and so we we worked, and that was part of the whole creating a maximum license fee within that. So, um, I mean, that's the data I want to use to make a determination, and like evaluate whether we have particular activities that are overburdened or underburdened for keeping the lights on and keeping the you know the the work going on. So, I mean, I. I get. It. I mean, our budgets have to meet our statutory obligations, and and yeah. I mean, even if there's no crime in a particular activity, that activity still, based on the Gambling Act, has a responsibility to pay for illegal activity uh, in gambling. So, yeah. I just. I mean, I guess we can start down this path. I mean, I certainly do not want to have a repeat of 2014 when you know we we did it across the board at that point and then we did layoffs and then a bunch of other people quit because they were mad because their friend got laid off or whatever so i mean i don't want to overreact i think we should be you know cognizant that we had a a bad quarter um way off from our projections but I, but I don't think that we need to panic. Um, but I, but I also don't want to be lagging behind. So, I mean, it feels like staff should be able to, you know, maybe whether there's rule making beginning or not, feels like we should be able to have some other data by this time next month, right? Uh, yes, our month, to be quite honest, you know, what, what do we have planned for the next few weeks? Our, all of our energies are going to be focused on, um, on RFI and, and what is going, what our next ask is going to be whether or not you're going to allow us potentially to, um, move forward with seeking a budget proviso if that RFI number is greater than what we have set aside. So, I mean, if, if that's a no, then right. we got a lot of time. So, um, but that's that's going to be our focus in the next few few weeks because we have a very short time period with the legislature right. to try to get that late ask across the board, across the finish line. So, um, you know, as you mentioned in 2014, with the reduction of of staff that we had to take. We have never been able to attain the number that we tried to go down to, and um, and so we we are at 97 FTE, and you know we have one person <laughs> leaving on Friday. So so again, we we just keep keep you know we haven't made it to that level yet. Um, so I would love to say we'll have some numbers, right? We'll be able to say what comes in in terms of revenue and where we're at with the RFI. Much more than that, I do not want to overpromise because we have to be back here on the, is it the 14th or the 8th? Yeah, so it's a, it's a short turnaround this month. Yeah, so just to add to what Tina said, if, if, the, if the ask is just, hey, what are the preliminary numbers for the filing that was due January 31st? We can provide that, but as you know, Director Griffin just referenced, I won't have enough time, nor will the statewide accounting system be caught up enough to do a really thorough analysis. of the, So it would just be preliminary numbers just to kind of give a, a peek of where we might be compared to you know, the quarter that we just had and maybe a little bit more of an update of what we expected versus what we're seeing. But I, 
there won't be sufficient time to have the data to do a thorough analysis before the next meeting. So I just wanted to offer that. Thank you. A lot of work to be done here. There is a lot of work to be done. Oh. <clears throat> Do we have a motion? Sounds like we might have to push a lot of stuff to March. Based on the conversation we just heard, so I don't know if that affects anything. The open making or, or not. Well. I mean, do we have any choice other than to initiate the process here? I mean, but it doesn't hurt to see what we can learn by initiating the process, right? I'm right. I mean, we're looking at a six month window to gather information. And if at the last minute it turns out we don't or we found other ways to get around it, then we just go back. I kind of see it as but it's a good conversation about how complicated I mean it helps us to see how complicated this is going to become so I, I move madam chair if you want a motion now to initiate a rulemaking proceeding proceedings on this topic so that we can have a, a broader discussion okay. I'll second okay. and we're seconded any further discussion all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. We will now take a Lay. break. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> but votes nay. <laughs> Sorry. But. No worries. No, that's perfectly fine. I just, yeah, I, I, um, <laughs> to the extent that we can focus in on a couple of these, I think that very easily, not very easily, very likely could fix some inequities and um, put us in a, a where we're comfortable with our financial situation. Well, hopefully in I'm a better place. Crossing my fingers. So.